Sunday, I'm going to open with reading an entire psalm. I don't know if you were following um, Jimmy or Joanne, but I was following Jimmy on that last song. (laughs) Great job, Joanne. Thank you so much. What a wonderful time. Not many of us can sing like that without an accompaniment, so uh, we'll have to tell Rebecca, no more vacation, okay? (laughs) We love her and we love you guys. Thank you for doing such a good job and leading us in worship. And uh, before I read this psalm, I want to mention as well, it's so good to see Corey and his family here after a triple bypass. You know, he wasn't sad about anything except for having to trim his manly beard a little bit. And uh, that's what he was asking prayer requests over to deal with that. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm so impressed at the camaraderie among our men. I hardly recognize Ken on the front row. And I think that he trimmed his beard in honor of Corey. Give Ken a big stand up, Ken. Let me see your beard too, you know. Wow. Like that much is gone. Wow. Well, you know, the relationships that we have here are a byproduct of Jesus Christ and the fellowship that we have in him. Our Christ-like lifestyle requires us also to live a cross-like lifestyle. And Jesus said to take up your cross and follow him. What does that mean for your life? How are you dying unto yourself so that you can be more of a Christ-like person? I'm going to read the entire psalm. It's more of an extended passage for our scripture reading today. I'm going to read Psalm 22. I want you to listen for the prophetic language in Psalm 22 as I read our text today, and then we'll stand and continue to worship our King. But Psalm 22 has um, some impressive prophetic language in it, and I want you to listen acutely for that. And then, just to prepare our little kiddos, um, after we sing a little bit more, we're going to have a kids' moment up on stage here. And so, Alyssa will have to prepare for that with uh, her little injury there. Psalm 22, if I could read it to you, and you listen for the things that will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cried by day, but do you not answer? And by night I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. And to you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip and they wag their head saying, commit yourself to the Lord and let him deliver you. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. And yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You've made me trust when upon my mother's breast, upon you I was cast from birth. And you have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as ravening and roaring as a lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a broken pottery or a potsherd. And my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And I count all of my bones. And they look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen you answer me. 
And I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the afflicted of the afflicted, and nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard, From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied, and those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. And all those who go down to the dust will bow before him, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. In verse 31, the last verse of the entire psalm says, And they will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has performed it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this most impressive psalm. And I pray that you would continue to bless us indeed. God, I pray that from the inside of our heart, you would create motivation to praise you, inspiration, Lord, to look up and never to be bound to the circumstances of this world. Help us to be heavenly minded and not earthly driven. Help us, Lord, to accomplish the things that you want accomplished here at the end of this Psalm, Lord, you performed it. You finished it. The completed work on the cross is something that you accomplished. And now it's our mission, Lord, to spread the gospel, to spread the fact that your finished work on the cross has paid for the sin of those who will repent and believe in you. God, I pray that we would consider ourselves ambassadors, as soldiers, as missionaries, as ones that need to tell a lost and dark world where the hope and where the light is. And today, Lord, we celebrate that finished work on the cross, that you died on the cross for our sins and God resurrected you. Father, I pray that you would help us to see this from your perspective and to be changed today. Help us, Lord, from the inside out to praise your name and to proclaim your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And God's people said, amen. 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 Let's stand and continue to sing. Thank you. Kids today? you I'm sorry? Children today? After we worship a okay. little bit more, it would be good. Okay, yeah. let's continue. Won't you stand with me? Aren't you grateful on that eventful Sunday morning when Mary and Martha decided to come very early that morning and they came to the grave? They were going to prepare the body of Jesus. And as they were approaching, they saw the stone had been rolled away and an angel was sitting there. And they were, I can't begin to imagine what their thoughts were at that point. But they were saying, they were concerned, well, what have you done with, with his body? And he said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen just as he said today because he is alive. We are alive as well because we placed our faith and our trust in him. Let's sing together. I live, I live. Because he is risen, I live, I live with power over sin. I live, I live because he is risen, I live, I live to worship him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because you're alive. Because you're alive. Because you're alive. I live. I live. I live. Because he risen. I live, I live with power over sin. I live, I live because he is risen. I live, I live to worship him. 
Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because you're alive. Because you're alive. Because you're alive. I live. I serve the risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King the hope of all who seek him the help of all who find none other is so loving so good and kind sing with me he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives, sing that again. He lives, sing that one more time. He lives within my heart Because He lives I can face tomorrow Because He lives all fear is gone because I know, I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just because He lives. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love and forgive. He lived and died to My Savior lives, sing with us now, because He lives, I can face tomorrow, because He lives, all fear is gone, because I know He holds the future, and life is worth the living just because He lives, and life is worth the living, and life is worth the living just because 
You may be seated, and I'll invite our kids to come up for a kid's moment here. Uh, we're going to come on stage, and then after that, I'll invite Hal Epperson to come and pray for our offering. So come on up, kiddos, and um, can you do it? Let's look there. Oh, man. Oh, man. Look how tough you are. Come on up. Come on up. We'll take a, a seat over here on this side. You got your Bible? All right. Good, good, good. Man, you are extra holy today, buddy. Where's your shoes? <laughs> Did they didn't fit on you? Yeah. Hey, you know what? There's a there's a passage in the Bible that talks about taking your shoes off when you're praising the Lord. So you're like the most holy dude in the house. <laughs> I just want to brag on our kids today. Um, Hannah, if you could open up to Psalm 22. I'm going to ask you to read a verse here in just a moment. But I found something at the welcome desk last week. And um, who's Hannah. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Abigail Brown. This is you, right? Guess what? Is this your handwriting? Yeah. Oh, I found this little note right here. You wrote it, and there was three nails on this note. And this note says, I found these in the Future Worship Center. I can tell you're a woman of faith because one of these days we're going to be worshiping God in that big building over there. I found these in the Future Worship Center. They remind me of Jesus. Abigail Brown, three nails. Isn't that cool? Wow. I'm going to give this to your parents so they can keep it. I wrote the date on here for Easter Sunday. I'm so proud of you. Not only am I proud of these girls for knowing Jesus, but I'm also proud of them as well. As they actually study the Bible. They don't just read it. And so if you could read that Psalm chapter 22, what is it, verse what? 16? Or... All right, read it to us. The dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. So the latter part of that verse says, they pierced my hands and my feet. Is there a reference? What, is it, what does a reference look like? How can you tell there's H? Okay. There's an H beside of what word? Pierced. Pierced. Okay. What does that H mean? Uh, like it's just like a reference. It's a reference? Okay. What's the reference scripture there for H? Luke 23, 33. Okay. What's the next one? John 20, 27. Let's read that one. All right. Sure. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Wow. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faith, faithless, but believing. Wow. I can't believe that you, at your age, already know how to look up references in the Bible. That is so good. So, the psalmist David, in Psalm 22, a thousand years prior to this, John, is saying the same thing. And you found that out because you read the references and chased it down. Isn't that cool? Please give Hannah a round of applause. That is so cool. And the reason why I know this is because we have family Bible study groups. And my wife told me that she knows this. So I knew that she could do this. And I wanted everybody to know that in our family Bible study groups, we worship together as families. And so we have all the generations worshiping the Bible together. So it's not only just the men with the men, just the women with women, but our kiddos go with us. And so you have the older generation teaching the younger generation and the younger generation, like as in the young adults or the teenagers, actually teaching these guys as well. So it's really, really cool to see a family discipleship church. I wanted uh, to point that out today to make sure that everybody knew what the purpose of our church is, is becoming a family discipleship church. And so please give them one more round of applause, and I'll invite Hal to come up and pray. Thank you. Right. 
All right, good morning. Um, yesterday afternoon, a uh, pastor texted me and asked if I would share a, a memorable Easter experience and then lead our offertory prayer. So given the time, I'm going to abbreviate this, but I immediately knew exactly the experience I would share. It was 1984, Easter Sunday morning. I think I was 17 going on 18. And on that Easter Sunday morning, my grandfather, who was a retired Baptist pastor, I think he was 80 years old at the time, he taught his men's Sunday school class. He closed that class in prayer. And then before the service, he closed his eyes in death and went on to be with the Lord on Easter Sunday. And I can remember three days later in South Carolina, standing there with my parents to my side and my grandmother and the congregation saying, victory in Jesus. And that made a, made a big impression on me as a 17-year-old boy, having just lost my grandfather and watching the congregation sing in a celebrative way, victory in Jesus. And so Easter Sunday to me is always wedded to that great hymn, victory in Jesus. And also by extension, the passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul the apostle writes, where, O death, is thy sting? Where, O grave, is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's go ahead and pray today. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to meet today as your people to celebrate the, your victory over death, sin, and the grave. And Lord, I give you thanks that as a, as a young boy, I heard the old, old story of a Savior who came from glory, who gave his life on Calvary to save a little wretch like me. I thank you, Lord, that when we repent from our sin and when we believe on the Lord Jesus, Lord, we share in that victory. And so today, so today Lord, with hearts of gratitude, I pray that we might give not reluctantly, not under compulsion, but with a cheerful and a thankful heart. Knowing that you are able to abundantly bless both the gift and the giver and provide for all of our needs that we may abound in the work that you've given us to do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Most precious treasure. 
its precious treasure His love and His own perfect self Sent here to show me The love of the Father Just for love it was done And oh, you were perfect and holy You gave up yourself willingly You spared no expense from my job, Jimmy. Thank you, sir. And that coming from a man who has um, just moved. If there was ever a time where I would expect someone to take a Sunday off is after moving, but he and his wife are so faithful to prepare and to come, and so I thank you so much for your leadership in our worship. Um, take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Psalm chapter 22. Psalm chapter 22, and we've already read the entire text, and so I will not do that again, but I would love to read the first verse and the last verse with you, and I will give you the title to today's message. Psalm 22 and verse 1, and then the last verse is verse 31, and then we will take a look at individual verses through this text today. Um, happy Easter Sunday, happy Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for coming. If you're visiting, you're welcome here. And we say around here all the time that a church that's alive is worth the drive. Amen. And some of you have come close and come from far, and we thank you for coming. Thank you for being here on Resurrection Sunday. In Psalm chapter 22, in verse 1, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance or the words of my groaning, oh my God. I cry by day, but you do not answer. This was, in fact, the fourth words from the cross. And then the very last verse in Psalm 22 is verse 31. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, and that he has performed it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this entire psalm. I pray that you would help us to understand it like as you have given it to us. I pray, Father, that you would enlighten our minds, help us to see it from your perspective, not from our worldview, but from your throne. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Here in the last verse, you see that he performed it. That is, it is finished. 
Therefore, the message title today is Paid in Full. I lo- love seeing Paid in Full. There was a time in my life where I had to go to the hospital and rack up a large bill, and you guys know there's just a massive amount of money to be made from preaching the gospel, right? <laughs> I'm glad you get my sarcasm there because I racked up a bill, and to be honest with you, it was rather weighty for a long time. Uh, the weight of having an unpaid bill was horrific. And well, after some time of dealing with that weight, um, there was some research done, and there was a way for that to be paid. And I got a glimmer of hope, and sure as a world, after a while, the hospital um, said that it was the entirety of that bill, everything, paid in full. I'm telling you, I felt like I was on a jet, just so high in the clouds. That was tremendous to see, paid in full. And that is what this psalm is saying. Not just a financial debt, but our sin debt from the very beginning. Everything that condemns us to hell for eternity has been paid in full. This is a glorious psalm. In fact, Psalm 21, verse 1, is the exact words of Jesus from the cross. A little bit about this Psalter. The book of Psalms contains 150 individual Psalms. Individual authors have been compiled, and these authors wrote from a perspective, from a personal experience, from a response to a personal experience. All the way from Moses to David over the approximately... About a a thousand years, you have different individual psalms that have been compiled for the Psalter, this book of Psalms. They were written for a variety of reasons. Let me rattle off just a few of the reasons as to why psalms were written. They were written for personal devotion reasons, for public worship, for poetry, prayers, laments, thanksgivings, wisdom, prophecies, Contrasting from the wicked to the righteous, instructions, meditations, theology, eschatology, salvation, reconciliation, weeping and singing, history, and even spiritual warfare, just to name a few. And as you read through the Psalter, as you read through all of these Psalms, you will see these subjects, but they're expanded upon from a first-person perspective. Today in Psalm 22, we're really going to see prophecy expounded upon. What is prophecy? Except it's just simply defined as this, a message from God. When a prophet speaks prophecy, he is speaking a message from God. Hence the reason why in the Bible you see, thus saith the Lord, over and over and over again. Thus saith the Lord, thus thus saith the Lord. Now, today we have the full counsel of God and the gift of prophesying has ceased. And so we have what the prophets said written down. We no longer need a prophetic word. So when pastors preach the word, they're not prophesying, they're speaking prophetically. Prophetically means just to say what the word says, to say what God says. But prophets, when the word was not written down, when the people could not open up their Bible, or they didn't have the scroll in hand, or they didn't have the manuscript in hand, God spoke through his men, and he gave them the words to say. And when they said this, then it was written down. God preserved his word, and it has been preserved through the centuries. Praise God for that. So Psalm 22 is David crying for help. He is a prophet, and he's crying for help. Now, he's crying for help in this psalm from personal experience. But yet, there's no personal experience in history or in antiquity that we can find. Normally, when you see the psalmists, whether it's David or Moses or another author, there is extra biblical evidence or historical collaborative writings to help us to see the backdrop of the psalm, to help us understand what's the author experiencing to make him say such things. But here the Psalms is written without the experience. But if you take from Psalm 22, let me just give you an example, and flip over to Psalm 23. We've just expounded upon Psalm 23 recently. So Psalm 22 to Psalm 23, verse 1, David says, The Lord is my shepherd. I'm just giving you an example. 
David could say that God is a shepherd, like a shepherd, because he used to be a shepherd. He has first-person experience, and he knows the attributes of God, and he knows what it is to be a shepherd who keeps sheep, and God, in a lot of ways, is one who keeps his sheep. So just to give you a little bit of a backdrop there on Psalm 23, now to go back to Psalm 22 and verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as this psalm is unfolded, we see that there's no reason as to why he would say all the things that are in this psalm. There's no explanation, there's no evidence, there's no scene, there's no crime. There's nothing to analyze to determine why he says all of these prophetic words. There's no writings of David to explain why he is saying in verse 1 that God has forsaken him. And in verse 7 that he's been sneered or mocked at. There's no explanations in history or antiquity to explain why in verses 12 and 16 that he's been surrounded Or that in verse 16 that he's been pierced in his hands and his feet. Or in verse 18 that his garments were divided. Nor that this is being told to the next generation in verse 30. There's nothing to explain why David is saying all of these things. And I just want to give you a quick disclaimer up front. For what's being proclaimed today. This prophecy will make you see Jesus or stray away from Jesus. This prophecy draws a line in the sand with where you are in your faith today. And I want to encourage you to believe in the cross. Believe in Jesus because of prophecy. There's one reason here that we can see there's a million reasons to believe in Jesus. But one reason today I'm saying is that a thousand years prior to this cross experience, David is prophesying about the details of the cross before crucifixion was even invented. And so this method of execution was not even a thing yet. The Romans had not invented crucifixion yet. Yet, David, as a prophet, is prophesying about the details, the vivid details of the cross. So, seriously... Did David orchestrate a mob to surround him and mock him and crucify him and strip him and bid for his clothes and then somehow survive this execution? Did he orchestrate this or is this prophecy? You must explain that. That's your job to think, okay, I'm going to explain it away or I'm going to believe in it today. But I'm telling you, there's no natural explanation. It is prophetical. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verses 29 and following, I'm going to read to you what the New Testament authors thought of David a thousand years prior. I'm not just telling you from my perspective to believe that David was a prophet and he was speaking prophecy. I'm going to tell you, take the word of God from Scripture that attests to the fact that David is a prophet. In Acts chapter 2, I think it is, yep, in verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you, reading the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Verse 30 in Acts chapter 2. And so, because he was a prophet, there it is, underline it. The author of scripture attests to the fact that David was a prophet. And guess what he says about it? Because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Isn't that so clear? David looked ahead. How far did he look ahead? A thousand years. Our country is not even a thousand years old. Not even close. How in the world can that happen except for it to be from God? In verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And therefore, 
Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, that being Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, and this is what I'm saying to us today, repent and believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. This psalm is pointing towards the cross so that we can believe that this is an actual historical event. God sent his son to die on the cross for the sin of those who would repent and believe. This pierced them to the heart. The Israelite naysayers, the negative ones, the accusers were pierced to the heart here. And they must believe in verse 36 that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. He's both master and savior. There is no believing in Christ without him being Lord or master of your life. There is so much of this easy believism going around in our country today in the clarification needs to be made about anything it needs to be made about the cross and who are actually Christians we do not want to participate in lulling someone to spiritual sleep so that they at the end of the day will hear Jesus say depart from me you doers of iniquity I never knew you we don't want to participate in that we want to be truth tellers and the truth of the scripture is that Jesus is not only savior in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, but he is master as well. You are driven by Christ. You're controlled. You're constrained by him. And true Christians recognize that it's not me that lives inside of me, but Christ lives in me. He has purchased me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And you're constrained to do God's will. You feel guilt when you sin. You feel guilt and you repent when you work against him. These are the attributes of a true Christian. And so, Jesus is both Lord and Savior. And this was being proclaimed, not only the message of the cross, but the verification of David being a prophet who speaks what God's message is. So, now that we have established that Psalm 22 doesn't have a historical backdrop of ex explanation, it's just simply a word from God through David. David did not experience a crucifixion. He did not experience all of this happening. God gave it to him and he's prophesying these things. Psalm 22 verse 1, David seems to be complaining. Look with me. My God, my God, why have you forsaking me. He, he seems to be complaining, but it's not a complaining. This is actually a confession. Now, in pain, David understands in his insufficiency, as he's crying out to God, that God is all-powerful, but he says this confession. He confesses. He actually claims that God is my God in the middle of pain. Look at it. My God. My God, a personal pronoun, my. David is claiming God to be my God in the middle of much anguish. My God. Now, Psalm 23, verse 1, he does it again. The Lord is my, what? Shepherd. So he's claiming God as his shepherd. He's claiming God as his God. Now, those who do not believe that God is their God, they blame God. They don't claim God. Those who do not believe in the resurrected Savior, the unconverted, the unrepentant, the unregenerate ones, they ironically blame God by even uses his, using his name in vain. How many times have you heard GD and then it just makes you cringe from the inside? But even the unbelievers know that God exists. You know how we know that they know that God exists? Because they use God's name in vain and they blame him for what's happening because they know that God is in control. You never hear someone blaming Buddha and using his name in vain. You never hear someone saying, Muhammad, you know, darn it or whatever. You never hear, hear you know, the Hindu god, Mishnah, you never hear all of that stuff. You always hear GD or Jesus. Even the unconverted, unregenerate people know. And we know this because of what the scriptures say in Romans chapter 1 that 
all know that God exists. I'm here to tell you that if you know God exists, then you know Satan exists. And if you know Satan exists, then you know God exists. And the Bible speaks very clearly about both of these deities. Now, when the unsaved feel like God has forsaken them, they don't claim him, they blame him. But David here in his passage claims God is his God. Guess what Jesus does on the cross? Guess what Jesus does on the cross? He does the same thing. He claims God. In Matthew chapter 27 in verse 46, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, Jesus claims God as his God. Now, I'm gonna ask you the question. It's kind of like the hammer coming down. Are you ready? Do you claim God or blame God when you're in a terrible situation? Oh, now, this gets to the very core of who you are because the Bible says not to complain or even murmur, right? In Philippians 2.14, we should be speaking positively about God no matter what the circumstances are because he is God, He is God of all things. He's the sustainer of all things. He's the orchestrator of all things. He's working all things for his glory and our good. We believe that. We believe that God is all-powerful, omniscient, and all-knowing. And by doing that, we don't murmur because we would be murmuring against God. And by murmuring against God, God takes it personal. And in the New Testament and Numbers, he kind of swallowed up a whole bunch of Israelites for doing that in an earthquake. As an example for us, don't murmur but there's a difference between complaining and murmuring. Complaining is verbalizing it. Murmuring is inside. And I mean, you know? Do you do that inwardly when things don't go your way? It's not actually getting on the phone and complaining to somebody or posting it on Facebook. It's deeper than that. If things do not go your way, if you are agonizing like David is in this psalm, if he is going through immense pain, if you're like Jesus on the cross being tortured by your enemies, we're not even to not only complain, but to, right? We're not even to murmur and or complain. We're to believe that God is in control. And so I'm saying to us, David, in this case right here, claims God as his God and does not blame God. Amen? Now, after confessing and claiming God as his God, David mentions that deliverance from this agony seems far away. Back to Psalms 22, verse one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far away from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Far away. He, he thinks that deliverance, and he thinks that the, the getting out from underneath this agony is so far away, he doesn't have any rest, yet he still claims God as his God. In verse two, oh my God. I cry by day, but you do not answer. Even in the midst of unanswered prayer, he is claiming God as his God, and he is believing in that. Now, I want to ask you a question. Back to the word forsaken in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Believing that this is a word of prophecy about what would come in a thousand years, Jesus would be born, and then he would be forsaken and brutally crucified. Believing that this is actually prophecy and that would come and we look back on the cross it did happen did God really forsake his own son it's worth asking the question because right here my God my God why have you forsaken could you imagine forsaking your own did God really forsake his son well Charles Spurgeon said because Christ was forsaken for a time You will not be forsaken forever. Isn't that good? Yes, he was forsaken. 1 John 2, 2 says, he being Jesus himself is the substitute or the propitiation for our sin and not for our sin only, but also for for those of the whole world. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, 15, it says that he died for all. Listen to 14 and 15 in 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of God, or the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all and therefore 
all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Yes, God forsook his son so that he could bear the penalty of sin. God forsook his son. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he being God, made him being Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we may become the righteousness of God. Isn't that amazing? Now, in verse three, you would think, okay, well, is God perfect in all of his dealings? Or is there blame on him for allowing bad things to happen? Bad things perhaps in David's life, bad things perhaps in his son's life to be uh, taking on sin Well, yes, Christ lived a perfect life, and yes, God is still holy even though horrible things happen in this world. In verse 3, David attests to that. He says, yet, okay, yet, even though all of Bad, all of the bad things that happen in this world, and then by a greater application, even though David feels like he has been forsaken, all right, abandoned, even though the righteous, the holy, the God who is in control, who could solve all of your painful circumstances, has seemed to have abandoned David in a time of his need, he says, yet you are holy, you, oh you, who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Here is a testimony as to how he is holy. In you, our fathers trusted. Who were the fathers? The Israelites. What's the situation that he's referring to of antiquity? The exodus, the wilderness experience. Yet they trusted and you delivered them. And so David is claiming God's goodness based upon his history of being good despite bad things happening. How long were the Israelites involved in some awful, I mean, 400 years? I mean, we complain if we got to go something through four minutes, right? Ah, to you they cried out and were delivered or rescued in verse 5. To you they trusted and were not disappointed or put to shame. So David expresses his trust in God despite the fact that horrible things happen on God's watch. God's in control. He sustains the heavens and the earth. Horrible things happen, yet God is completely holy. Now one, only a person of faith who is saved can completely trust in God and have peace and actually sleep When you know that God is all-powerful and yet you still have the problem of evil. Only those who are regenerated, have a new heart, have been given a new understanding, the ability to see the truth from God's word, have the ability to sleep while suffering. Only they can apprehend that kind of faith and have access to that kind of peace, okay? When we look at the Exodus experience, we can see how Israel was enslaved, but yet God delivered them. You see the big picture. Now he moves on from a testimony of trust to expressing how he has been rejected by men. And now obviously David is uh, able to speak from a first-person experience for this particular experience because he was rejected by men and even his son, but he is speaking prophetically In that, men rejected Christ. Look in verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag their head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver you. Let him rescue you because he delights in him. Now, when David speaks from first person here and he says but I am a worm and not a man Uh, he got that right Uh, in fact in the Hebrew worm means maggot and so worm is about this big and the maggot is about this big so it's more accurate to say you're not even a worm you're a maggot 
When we have a proper estimation of our righteousness, we see what we amount to. We, in our good works, in our righteousness, as compared to a pure and holy God, are filthy. We do not measure up. No wonder we can't pay for our own sin. Hey, David is right. We are not even a worm. David's accusers are right. We are not even a worm. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says that our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And if you like to do word studies, this one is rather graphic because the word filthy here, a filthy garment, refers to a stained menstruation rag. And that is the equivalent of our best deeds. That's what you have to offer to pay for your sin. That is what our righteous deeds amounts to in the eyes of a pure and stainless holy God. And so our best is just simply wretched. Our best is deplorable and unacceptable in the sight of God. Our best actually is condemnable. You're condemned based upon your deeds and your good works. Romans 3.10 says there is none righteous, no, not even one. And in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, listen to this, therefore, just as through one man, that being Adam, sin entered the world. This kind of triggers your mind to Genesis, right? Sin entered the world and death through sin. We have that sin passed down through the ages, and now we have a death sentence. You have to deal with that weightiness. You have to make sure that your death sentence is paid for, paid for in full. You have a death sentence. So death spread to all men because all sinned. And we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, not only because the New Testament says so, but because we measure ourselves against the law in Exodus chapter 20. And you see the Ten Commandments, and you can't even pass the first one. Now, in Romans chapter 5, verses 17 and following, for if by the transgression of one, being Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in him through one, Jesus Christ. So the solution is through one. The problem came through one. In verse 18, so then, as through, the, through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. If you write in your Bible, circle the word act, there's one act of righteousness, and just draw a cross right there. That is what the act is referring to. In verse 19, for as though the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. Isn't that great? So Adam brought condemnation, but Jesus brings justification. When you have an accurate assessment of mankind, of who we are, the psalmist also said, what is man in Psalm chapter eight? What is man? Well, when we know that man, man and woman, mankind, is simply less than a worm, not even a maggot, but filthiness in the eyes of God. Because of the stain of sin, the stain of sin has to be removed or paid for. You have an accurate estimation of mankind and reality. So in summary, Christ is holy, but men are filthy. Christ is holy, but men are filthy. That's what's being plainly explained here. And now when Verse 6, when we see the filthiness of men is despised, you see more prophetic language. Listen to the word despised, also prophesied by Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 53, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one whom hid their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Now I'm going to read three more verses. And I want you to see these personal pro pronouns of our and we and us. It is our sin that placed Jesus on the cross. Surely our griefs 
he himself bore. And our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, and each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Our iniquities, our sin, whatever you might consider as your righteous deeds that amounts to nothing but filthiness, our deeds, our sin, our righteousness, according to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, fell on him. Folks, that is a filthy exchange. He takes on our unrighteousness and gives us his righteousness. He takes on our filth, our unworthiness, and he bears it on the cross, and he gives us the paid in full stamp. Boom. Paid for, sealed, saved, delivered. That is the message of Easter. This is prophecy fulfilled. Back in Psalm 22 and verse 7, on the cross, Jesus was sneered at and mocked and ridiculed. In verses 7 and 8, and all who see me sneer at me, and they separate with the, the lip, and they wag their head saying, commit yourself to the Lord, and so on and so forth. Have you ever been sneered at and mocked before, especially when you're down and out. Isn't that terrible? Well, all who see me mock me or sneer at me. And this happened, actually happened in Matthew chapter 27 in verse 37. It actually happened. And above his head, that Jesus is on the cross right now. Matthew is attesting to these historical facts. There's actually extra biblical evidence and writings from historians that attest to this. This actually happened. And above his head, they put up a charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, that is a mocking statement in itself. I'll read the rest of it to you, and you hear the sarcasm. You hear the abuse being hurled at Jesus. At that time, this is verse 38, two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others and he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. And if he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. And so while Jesus was on the cross, he was being mocked. David foretold that that would happen in Psalm 22. I want to ask you a question. When you as a Christian are the object of scorn and ridicule and being mocked, when you are treated with enmity, when you're opposed, when hostility comes in at you and, is, and you're surrounded and severely reproached, are those reproaches... Valuable or detestable? Mm, that's a good answer. And if we were in Bible study, I would say prove it, but I'll prove it with you. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews eleven twenty six. I want you to see that as a Christian, when you suffer reproach, just like Jesus suffered reproaches and had abuses hurled at him verbally while he was in a vulnerable state on the cross being crucified, when you are the object of scorn and mockery and reproach, that, that moment when it hurts the worst, that is the moment for which is most valuable. Most valuable. Hebrews eleven twenty six. 26 
Let's just, let's just read verse 24 for context. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking forward to the reward. You have got to have an eternal mindset in this world now. You have got to be able to see towards your eternal rewards in that the reproaches of Christ that you suffer are more valuable than all of the gold in Egypt. If you could pile up all of the gold in Egypt and look at that pile, one trial that you go through because you're a Christian is more valuable than all of that wealth. That's what the Bible says is saying that is a mindset adjustment for Christianity most Christians in a comfortable American setting are like they want everything spoon fed to them and they don't want any of the waters to be troubled they don't want any disruptions of their spirit but did not Jesus come to bring a sword right he didn't come to bring peace folks we have to fight for righteousness and be willing to be mocked to be willing to be scorned, to be willing to be called out. And when you are, it actually proves that you're saved. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. 1 Peter 1. I want you to see this. When you are scorned for your faith, it actually proves that you have faith. When you are mocked and severely, sarcastically made fun of because you're a Christian, it actually verifies that you are truly saved. And so the truth goes in the other direction as well. If you have not been mocked for your faith, you may not have faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice. The whole context here is suffering and trials. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that the, circle these words, proof of your faith. Your faith is proven through the trial, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to the result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter not only said it here, but he also said in chapter 4, verse 12, do not be surprised at the fiery trials of your life. Don't be surprised. Are you surprised when you're mocked and ridiculed? Don't be surprised. You should expect these things because we are strangers in a lost world. And guess what? When someone mocks you and they come against your Christianity, they're actually verifying that Christianity is real. And guess what? When they come against your Christianity, that's actually the starting point of them having to deal with the fact that Christ is in you. And when you are shining like stars, like a light, they are actually being drawn to that light. They're pointing it out. They're mocking and acknowledging. And at that point, you have the awesome opportunity to live a Christ-like, cross-like life lifestyle die to yourself and still be forgiving and loving no wonder christ was able to say on the cross forgive them for they know not what they do so have you suffered for your faith well then you're saved if you have not been mocked and ridiculed for your faith then you may not be saved the trials of your faith Prove that your salvation is genuine. And when Jesus said on the cross, forgive them, he was looking more towards the destination of their soul and agonizing because of the fruit of their actions being telltale of who they are. He wanted them not to perish, but to be saved. And so, if you view the crucifiers, right, the Romans... And even the Israelites who planned the whole thing, if you view them as the people who are filthy sinners, if you view them who crucified Christ as the wretched, the vile aggressors, 
and those who are filled with heresy. If you view the ones who put Jesus on the cross in a negative light, in a pious way, in a self-religious way, maybe you have the wrong view of yourself because we are them. We are the ones who put Jesus on the cross. It was our sin who caused Christ to be crucified. We are no better than the crucifiers in the grand estimation of who we are outside of Christ. But if you see yourself as one of those sinners who crucified Christ, you have the right estimation of yourself. It's been said that good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. And so if you think that you're a good person because you didn't crucify Christ, you're wrong. But if you think of yourself as a bad person with sin, a sin problem that's depraved, and you need that solution, you need that salvation, you have a correct estimation of Jesus and yourself. And so saved people go to heaven. Lost people think that they're good. As I start to conclude, all of this prophetic and language and all these vivid details they were, of the cross, they were carried out by people who did not even know about Psalm 22. The Romans who were crucifying Christ, the ones who actually pierced his skin, the ones who actually divided his garments, they didn't even know that a thousand years prior in Hebrew Psalms that this was foretold. And so I'm saying to you today, a thousand years prior, all these details fulfilled, you must believe that the scriptures are true or you must push it away and explain it away. And I call us today to repent and believe in Christ. If you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, if you've never been saved, repent of your sin. That's what the Bible says to do. Acknowledge that you have sinned. We know this. I've read the scriptures to you. You know the scriptures are true. And now it's time to simply acknowledge to God, yes, I've sinned. It's very easy to acknowledge and see yourself in the mirror. But it's hard to repent of that and acknowledge that and confess your sin and turn from your sin and believe in the salvific work of Jesus on the cross because it is finished. In Psalm 22, verse 31, it is finished. It is finished it is finished. I'll read it to you. He has performed it. It is finished. That prophetic word was recorded by the Apostle John in John 19, 30. And believe it or not, the word in Psalm twenty-two thirty-one, 31, he has performed it is in the Greek just one word. And it means, oh, this is good. Are you still listening? Or did you fall asleep? All right, here we go. This is like the climax. The last words here in Psalm 22, in the Hebrew maybe one, more than one word, but in the Greek it's one word, and it means paid in full. This prophetic psalm says that Jesus' work on the cross paid for the sin of those who would believe. I'm asking you, would you repent and believe if you've never done that? Do business with God. I'm going to pray here in just a moment and I want to give you a, a personal experience. Perhaps David did not experience something personal to make this psalm real, but I experienced something personal yesterday that made this psalm very, very real. My wife wasn't home. The girls were away, so I made myself some pizza in the oven. And when I put the mittens on and pulled the pizza out and put it on top, I took the mittens off and put them away and the oven rack was crooked. And so I, without oven mittens, straightened the rack. <laughs> You've done it before, I see you have. <laughs> I can never, ever explain the eternal punishments of hell. But I can get just a momentary glimpse of just how hot and awful hell is. And I don't want anybody to go there. God doesn't want anybody to go there. Death, hell, and the grave was designed for Satan and his demons, not for his creation. Folks, listen. Hell is a place of eternal fire and eternal suffering, both internal and external. 
The flame will not be quenched, and the worm dieth not. There are very few places in all of the Bible where you have something that is repeated three times. And three times Jesus said, where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Other times in the Bible, you have an escalatory way of saying things like woe, woe, woe. There's an escalatory way of understanding what is being communicated here. Jesus is saying, listen, the fire is not quenched. You will have a glorified body, whether you're in heaven or in hell, that can endure the pain and suffering of eternal flames, yet you will not be burnt up. There is no such thing as annihilation. Eternity is eternal, whether you are there or there. But not only is it a physical torment, it is an inner anguish where the worm dieth not. That refers to that maggot, that thing, that that bug, that worm, that eats at the inner part of a corpse after war. Jesus brought to their minds where the worm dieth not because they would know after a war there is a mass slaughtering there in the middle and all the corpses right away would have maggots eating at the inside of their body. And that is descriptive, perfect might I say, perfectly descriptive of your conscience for eternity in hell being eaten away by regret of rejecting a pure and holy Jesus Christ and his substitutionary atonement for you. Forever there is an, like a worm eating at the inside of your soul of regret in eternity because of the rejection of Christ. It is upon you to repent. It's upon you to receive Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Repent and believe the gospel. Do not go to an eternal hell where there is flames that are not quenched and a worm like guilt that eats at the inside of your soul for eternity. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. I say this for your benefit, God's glory today. Pray with me. Father, it is a wonderful thing to be able to know the true gospel, the gospel, the life-saving gospel and that, as it has been being proclaimed, even from thousands of years prior, we see it clearly in your word. Father, if there is one here, two here, three here, there's many visitors today. If there's anyone here, even ones who have been going to church their entire life, if there's anyone who has never bowed their knee and confessed to you that they are a sinner in need of your substitutionary work on the cross to be applied to their sin debt so that they could be stamped and sealed paid in full. I pray and I plead, dear God, for that unbeliever that they would confess, that they would pray to you even now. Lord, today could be the day of their salvation, the writer of Hebrews said. Today is the day of your salvation. Father, I plead with them, the unconverted, the unregenerate, the unsaved. They know who they are. I don't know who they are, Lord. You do and they do, but I pray that faith would come by hearing the word of God, as your word says, that they would confess and believe. And now, Lord, as we have a time of reflection, a hymn to be sung while we simply pray and do business with you, Lord, and reflect upon our own lives, I pray that your good Holy Spirit would draw souls into salvation. And I pray as well, Lord, for the saved to be continually sanctified at this dear church. If anyone needs to be saved, Lord, I'm available to pray with them. I pray that they would be saved and be baptized and join this local church, study your word, and then go and spread the gospel. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.